Who moved my user? <laughs> okay, um, so uh, welcome to the talk. I maybe should explain the title a bit before we move on. I'm not going to be talking about the move, so if that's what you're here for, it's the door. Um, it is, of course, a reference to a recent change. It's also a reference to a management book you may have heard of, Who Moved My Cheese? Um, it's a great book. I highly recommend you get a copy. Don't read it. Put it on your desk. Your manager will love it. <laughs> no. It is a good book. Cheesy analogy. Uh, that was a cheesy... Okay, I'll stop. I'll stop. So, this is a departure from my usual talks. Normally, I talk about things I'm doing, things I've done. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about change. We live in a world that constantly changes. All kinds of different change, you know. I'm mid-30s now and getting increasingly older, uh, and I've seen some stuff. I'm sure the greybeards have seen even more. I started out with computing back in the 80s with 8-bit micros, like I'm sure many of you did. You know, I had the, the circuit schematics from the manufacturer, and I sold it on the motherboards. It was great fun. And then it was washed away by the 16 bits and my beloved Amiga, which I didn't sell so much, only when I blew the CIA chips up. Uh, that was washed away by the PCs, and I had a while off from computing them because I really didn't like the PC very much. Um, so, a few choice quotes here. Uh, I like the Heraclitus ones. Only thing that doesn't change, change itself, I guess, is uh, a more direct statement of what I'm, what I'm getting at here. I have a flaky USB port, so if my phone keeps popping up, that's why. Um, so, the talk is kind of in three stages. To begin with, I just want to think about change, um, just to kind of drive home the point that it's never going to stop, you know, unless you lock yourself in a, uh, an anechoic, silenced uh, chamber with a Faraday shield around it. You're going to live with change. And, I mean, thousands of years ago, Heraclitus pointed this out. The more we know about the universe, we more, the more we know that it's unconstant and continually changing and, uh, and evolving. So it's really one of the inevitabilities of life, a bit like death and taxes. The world is dynamic. If we stand still, sooner or later we die. We can't adapt to the new threats that emerge. We can't take advantage of the new opportunities that are present. Just like the evolution of life, you know, if you're not competing, you're not relevant, and you won't exist very soon. Uh, I'm sure all of us want Linux to, uh, yeah, as uh, the guy said earlier, become the de facto modern operating system. I know that's what I hope for. Um, that said, it can be upsetting. It can be turbulent. Um, we often tend to resist change as humans, and actually that dynamic interplay of driving forward and, and holding back. It's a bit like the, the fact that forking is one of the things that helps us not to fork. Um, so it's, it's a natural thing, and it's how we react to it that, uh, that really makes a difference. And sometimes, I know this, uh, this is true of myself as, as much as anyone else, I don't always stop to evaluate, really, is this a good thing or a bad thing, before I react to it. And it's, it's pushing the instinct down and, and looking with a, a logical view Okay, if the change breaks something for me now, is there a way that I can do that? Um, one of my favorite uh, quotes from the, the movie Wayne's World, uh, we fear change. Um, and we do. Uh, I'm, like I guess many people in the software world, uh, uh, an Asperger's syndrome case, and I don't like things changing. Um, not so much when it's on my computer, but when it's my environment, my routine, that's, that's very distressing. And abrupt changes, especially if we don't know about them in advance, these are the ones that can really drive us to try and preserve that status quo, even if it's somewhat irrational. Um, who knows, uh, a, a hacker still likes to work at virtual terminals on a very old machine. I certainly know them. Um, I guess I maintain a lot of very old development habits and uh, things that some of my colleagues look at, well, where I kind of keep this map of the trees I work on in my head, and my, my preferred tool for finding my way around is GREP. And all C-scope you 
digging. And Seascope's ancient today. You know, <laughs> I'm really behind the times. So just look at me and go, what are you doing? Um, so what can we do about this? Well, I'll hopefully return to that and you know, maybe even make some, uh, some suggestions. Yeah, uh, potentially disruptive um, changes and ways for you to adapt to them, I'm afraid. Uh, part of being involved in open source and using it is to engage with it and to find ways to make it work for you. you know? One of the, the things when I broke away from the Microsoft hegemony of the late 90s was I didn't want somebody to dictate to me how my computing worked. I wanted a more active role in making a decision. What did I use? How did I use it? And what could I, what could I get from it? Um, you know, we, we tend to select things and acquire things that solve problems for us. If something's not solving the problem for you, change it, replace it. And that's, that's very much a central theme in, uh, in what we all do. So just following on from Leonard's talk, uh, he's looking forward. I'd just like to look backwards for a while. Um, some of this actually predates my involvement in Linux. Uh, I'm looking maybe two, three years before I really ran a distribution or, or logged into a Linux box, and kind of eight years before Red Hat. So uh, feel free to heckle, uh, throw stuff. I will warn you, I've got a good throwing arm. I will return them if I disagree. Um, especially the older Red Hatters, if I make any boobs here, please do me, I'd much rather be accurate than uh, slick in the delivery. So, 1995, forget the Windows release, it was all about big L, little I, nut 2.0. Um, I wasn't there, didn't use it. Um, it's one of the few releases I haven't later run in a VM just to kind of go, ooh, lay, look, this is old. Um, I'm wearing a t-shirt from the UK National Museum of Computing. I'm very much a retro computing fan. In fact, one of the things that, that drove me to computing in the first place was these amazing machines with spinning things and blinking lights. Imagine my disappointment when I arrived in the 90s we were kind of dying off by the time I got there. Um, I used to have a rack for 6000s and very old spy machines that, that was very useful for heating the house, but not so much for <laughs> kind of doing useful things. Um, this was early on in Red Hat's development. There wasn't so much of an expectation or uh, a pre-existing history to break. I think people were largely very much pushing forwards. Um, the, uh, the historical documents that I've managed to unearth uh, recorded very few deaths, uh, none that I could uh, find. So 1996 brought us the 3.x series, uh, 303, uh, which I gather was a uh, marketing number driven by Bob from some of the things I've read. And ELF replaced A.out here. Now, for those of you that, uh, that are into your executable formats, I'm sure very few people would stand up and, uh, and defend A.out as something we should have held on to. You know, it was awful. Static uh, shared object load processes, so you had to have this kind of like uh, the Nana handing out, oh yeah, you're going to load your library here, you'll load it there. Uh, which was already being used by the majority of the Linuxes at this point, um, allowed us to really make DSOs a, a central feature of the operation. One exception here, because the ABI wasn't complete at the time, is the alpha architecture, which, you know, again, at that point in Red Hat's history was uh, not so much on the down as, as on the up, and we've seen others come and go since then, Itanium anyway. Um, also, one of the interesting things I find looking back to the uh, early years of Red Hat, uh, and one of the memes that I come to hear is, oh, Red Hat's the proprietary Linux company. Well, when you look at some of the earlier distributions, and this reflected the uncertainty in where, where was Linux going to fit into this bigger picture in the day, we included a lot more proprietary stuff, not necessarily in the distribution, but often on the disk, so we made it very easy to get. Things like the Metro X proprietary accelerated X server. Anyone remember that still? Nobody use it, yeah? Yep. Um, later on came 304. Um, PAM arrived, the pluggable authentication modules. Not too much disruption there, I don't think, unless you did like I did and screwed up the syntax and then you couldn't log in and reboot, break into my box. Uh, we also got kernel 2.0. Um, this was the first release to bring modernity. 
uh, so we could dynamically load things. And hey, we didn't need to ship 72 different kernels. You know, I, it just seems Stone Age like flints and bear skins today to, uh, to think that you would have to make a selection like that just to have your, your hardware work correctly. And uh, I've not been able to find any, uh, any recorded fatalities as a result of these changes. But, you know, the late 90s were a time of great change, a bit like now, and things started to pick up a little bit. Uh, certainly the contention and the disagreement did. So 1997 brought us uh, Red Hat Linux 4 and then later on 5 and 5.2, which really this is, this is about the period that, uh, that I entered into Linux. Uh, I, sorry to admit it, but uh, my gap year before university, I worked as a Windows administrator and a Microsoft Access database developer. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, during this time, one of the companies I supported had this little white box that did all the mail and it ran something called Red Hat. Uh, and occasionally, wrong, my boss would call up this guy in Swansea called Alan, who I always visioned with a big beard. Turns out I was right. Um, I wanted to move away from this, but uh, I was really still too young in, in the Linux world to, to appreciate the controversies going on at the time. Um, looking back, though, we were in the days of libc5 then. Um, how many people remember the libc5 to glibc transition? Yeah, fair number. So Linux libc's uh, uh, one through five were basically a four earlier glibc. Lots of custom development in there, tweaks to suit Linux better. Um, very little of the code ended up folded back into glibc, although many of the same developers later worked on it. That had more to do with the FSF and, and copyright assignment and being able to track the, uh, the heritage of the code than any uh, technical objections between the teams. But in 97, with 4.2, we shipped a slightly old libc5, 5.3. Uh, and we got some stick for it. Or well, they got some stick. It wasn't we, I, them. And the reason for this was 5.4 added some new funky features. And actually, this was a decision that I think history proves we were in the right on. Um, the deluge of bugs that swamped the other distribution, you know, third-party applications especially just exploding in flames, shards of memory address space <laughs> flying everywhere. Um, that, was, that was a pretty good move. And, and 4.2 was relatively quiet. I still have a VM with 4.2 running at home. I log into it sometimes and go, oh, simpler times. Um, 495 Beta arrived later on in the year, and this brought with it glibc2, and then the arguments flipped the other way. So now Red Hat was shipping bleeding edge, and you're breaking everything. Um, and again, I think this sets a, a theme for Red Hat. We are very often um, developing the new technologies. Not always. We are quite happy to adopt uh, things that come from elsewhere. Um, we don't uh, particularly engage in not invented here. Um, but very often we drive through these technologies in our distribution, we deal with the breakage that happens, and fast forward 6, 12, 18 months, the other distributions are following along and adopting them as well. Yeah, we're not always the trailblazers, and there are times that, that other distributions push ahead, so three, four years later than this, uh, SUSE beat us to get the first 2.6 distribution out. A little while after that, uh, Ubuntu got Network Manager in there and got the press for that, which kind of galled a little bit, given the contributions to the code from Red Hat. Um, one of the things that, again, is a, a kind of general point on change, people tend to be reluctant to change things when it's not obvious that there's an immediate benefit. If it's not broken, don't fix it. The trouble is software is used by so many people, and it has to adapt to so many different situations. It may not be broken for you. That doesn't mean it's not horrendously broken for some other important group of users. Um, I think a, a good example here is more recent, but Pulse Audio. You know, how many people have not heard the meme, Pulse Audio wrecks everything. There's no need for it. Why do I need multi-session audio? Well, maybe you don't on your laptop. But if, <laughs> if you're blind and you need a screen reader at your login prompt, if you need multi-session audio to work, or even if you just want to be able to control levels across different applications. 
you probably do want it. And a few years ago, you know, everybody just ripped it out. I just haven't touched it in years. It just simply works. My audio works. And yeah, again, not many dead in the long run, I think. So moving up to the millennial tension, um, 99 to 2002. Uh, I'm kind of cramming more releases in here because uh, I'm weary of, uh, of overrunning the time. I'd like to give uh, a bit of time for questions at the end or in between if people want to shout them out. Um, all at sixes and sevens. Well, the six series was, was actually pretty uh, uncontentious, I guess. A lot of very positive reviews. Also, Red Hat's first enterprise support offering, not a separate distribution this time, just an E on the end of the product name and a differing level of support agreement for that. Um, 6.0 had GCC2, uh, eggs 1.2. Um, another quick show of hands, who remembers eggs? Yeah, I'd say about 50-50, I guess. Uh, so eggs was the uh, enhanced or experimental GNU compiler suite, uh, a short-lived fork, which eventually uh, moved. G 6 1 to 6 2. Again, the world failed to end on uh, New Year's Eve 1999, uh, at least for most people. And FTP ISOs appeared. Um, I, I wasn't there at the time. Does anyone remember? Is this the release that caused a switch to melt down in one of the data centers when everybody was trying to down at once? Red Hat Linux 7 maybe was one of the more controversial. Um, I'm sure folks here remember this one. Um, GCC 296 was a, an interesting decision. Um, I think in many ways technically sound. For those who weren't there at the time, um, 296 was a snapshot that Red Hat took from the development tree you know, with entire endorsement and cooperation of our own GCC developers. There maybe could have been better communication in some aspects. I can't really speak for that. I don't want to put words in, in anyone else's mouth. But from a technical point of view, the 295.2 uh, release from Upstream that was current at the time was pretty good on x86. And it sucked hard on all of the other architectures that we cared about. So we made this decision to take the snapshot, ship it with some Red Hat patches on there. Eventually, it was renamed 296RH. And we also had KGCC. Um, I've got some references and sources at the end. It's probably easier to grab them from the slides once they go online. But you can read things like uh, Linus's reaction to that, uh, Bob's open letter to the community, and many, many, many insightful slash dot postings on the, the whole <laughs> debacle. Um, 2002 and 2003, um, and this was when I was really, I'd finished university and I was starting to work in the, uh, the Linux world, well, kind of. I was employed by a Windows guy, uh, a Windows company rather, um, but working explicitly on Linux and open source technologies, developing as part of my postgrad work, uh, high performance MPEG transcoders. Um, so I was using um, Red Hat Linux 8 day to day then, LVM1 appeared, it was awesome. Uh, it let me make all kinds of mistakes in my partitioning layout and just kind of fix it all up later. Actually, it later turned out that I was employed by that Windows company, not because they wanted the codex, they wanted to get a deal licensing with Microsoft. The sales guy came to visit and he said, oh, hey, this is the Linux guy. We're looking at Linux. And the price went down. <laughs> so there was another new feature with Red Hat Linux 8. Uh, consistent, unified uh, look and feel intended to work across the GNOME and KDE environments. Um, a lot of users really valued this. Um, and again, the slash dot threads speak of this today. Some not so much. Um, uh, some of the KDE developers were also um, in quite a bit of disagreement with this decision. They felt that it was crippling aspects of KDE. Placing native Conqueror web browser with the Mozilla suite, uh, which ran a bit slower and caused some upset. Um, generally speaking, for me, I didn't have a, a, a big really like Red Hat Linux 8. Um, I didn't have too many ancient uh, uh, 8859 using applications. The UTF 
support. And actually, if you did, it wasn't so hard to work around it. Uh, and that's a theme that I'll come back to at the end, that uh, if something does break for you, you've got a few options to make it not matter. Uh, GNOME 2 arrived, um, became my default desktop then. Uh, I tweaked uh, a theme based on the mist uh, look and feel, and I had my own icon sets, and then I made my own uh, Firefox high contrast uh, icons because I really like the black simplicity. And, and now in no stuff anymore, it looks the way I want it to. So, thumbs up. Um, I carried that theme um, initially just kind of manually tweaking it. Eventually, I got a bit smarter and I scripted the gconf configuration changes. Uh, I even put it in an RPM at one point. Um, and I carried that really right up until um, Fedora 15 and GNOME 3. Um, so I wanted to preserve my nice look and feel, keep my universe the same. Uh, and not have to kind of go, where, where do, and what's the icon this week? Uh, not that there was a great deal of change, but like I said, I'm, I'm a bit sensitive to it. So Red Hat Linux 9 came along after that one, and I have to admit, this one bugged me a little. Uh, I'm speaking totally personally here, and maybe I understood the change better. Six months later, the uh, Windows company said, never came back the next week or the first and uh, moved to Surrey and, uh, and joined Red Hat. Um, nine, my beef was this, this change to Red Hat Network that I had 10 machines and now I needed a separate account for each one of them and I had to do these surveys to keep the updates flowing. I started looking at other distributions then. I was seriously considering replacing everything with, with Debian. Um, I didn't in the end, uh, partly because I was leaving, um, also because the machines were not network facing and I really didn't think anyone was going to do any maintenance after I left, so you know, what's the point having a maintenance route for them? Some of the more technical changes here, uh, and again, these were very clear steps forward, real progress taking place, and they still managed to uh, kick up some unhappiness in, in some quarters. So uh, NPTL arrived, the native POSIX threading library from Uli Drepper. Now, compared to uh, the earlier Linux threads implementations, either ye oldy Linux threads with uh, fixed thread location, pretty bad violations of the pthread semantics, or the later one, which had floating threads, you had a bit more flexibility. Um, I shouldn't bash Linux threads too much, by the way. I mean, Xavier, the guy who it, uh, it was a tour de force for one person that in those days without really any special kernel support. Uh, as you may well be aware, MPTL uh, kind of cooperates pretty closely with the O1 scheduler. Um, that reduced our, our scheduling overheads from the, the traditional Linux scheduler, which was ON in the number of processes that were running. Literally, there is this loop. All the processes, how good are they? Right, run that one. Yeah. Your scheduler just makes one decision. What do we do next? The O1 does it in time, and it really enabled this, this more advanced, more flexible threading model. Um, for those of us who were still bleeding from red threads and green threads as just memories of that, and it also brought this environment variable, which I think perhaps could take the award for uh, most legendary environment variable on Linux. I mean, the beliefs and myths and legends around this are, are unbelievable. Uh, you still find, I, I think, the most recent article I could find on a certain database vendor's website from 2009 recommending that you use this. Well, guess what? It doesn't do anything on modern distributions. It's entirely ignored. But, you know, if it meets your cargo cult fetish, then, yeah, go ahead. It's not going to do any harm. <laughs> All it does is to switch between the really old, the not so old, and the latest, greatest libraries. That's all it did. Uh, last five or ten years with recent applications, if you are setting it, you're, you're just waving a dead chicken at it. It's <laughs> not going to do anything. 
Okay, so um, that's where we stop the, the historical. I guess most people here are, are much more familiar with what happened to that. Linux 10 became Fedora Core 1. It escaped into the community where it's been living a happy life ever since, mostly. Um, of course, there were more disruptive changes to come. Fedora Core 2 brought us the 2.6 kernel. I remember in those days, I was, I was kind of just joined Red Hat, and uh, in my interview, my bo or soon to be boss asked me, uh, Would you be interested in teaching kernel classes? I said, Yeah, yeah, I'd need to read a book, maybe do some training. Started the job. Oh, we have a kernel class book for two weeks. You will be able to teach that, won't you? So it was a bit of a steep curve. Um, at the time, a lot of people were questioning, will the 2.6 kernel ever be used in embedded systems? And many embedded people, very informed embedded engineers, were saying, no, too big a memory footprint, features we don't need. Uh, I think there are very, very few embedded systems in legacy that are still running and, and maintaining their own 2.4 kernels. It really did become part of history. Then a couple of re releases later, we had Zen. Uh, Changes there, fun changes in some ways, but it broke a few things for me. And things that maybe have, have kind of been lost to history. Pup and Pirate, people remember those things? The, the cool new update. Um, so, have a look on the Fedora, uh, Fedora Project website if you're interested in the history. There are pages for both the Red Hat Linux history that I've just covered and the, the future Fedora, or future Fedora history, that makes no sense, sorry. Um, for now, though, I'd like to kind of look at uh, coping with change, surviving change, practical things that we can do uh, or not do to try and insulate ourselves from this or to help us embrace it, uh, depending on what outcomes you're looking for and where you set your own priorities. So, first point, there are a number of memes I would love to see die. Um, sacred cat. Just because something is old does not make it good. I kind of chuckle when people complain about GNOME 3 moving their cheese around because to me it was always the Windows 95 desktop model, you know, with the start button, okay, by a different name, but it's very, very similar. And I never really understood. I mean, the, um, the Amiga desktop will always be intuition the most Wonderful, no, not really. I, I, d I moved on, I moved on. Um, so we should question these things, we should reconsider them at times. Maybe it's not for everyone, but I think we have more choices today of desktop environments online than we ever had. I mean, I came through TWM and uh, Enlightenment, early GNOMEs, XSCE for a while. Uh, I'm back on GNOME 3 at the, de uh, at the moment. It works really well for me. Maybe not for you, um, and maybe, if that's the case, either get involved to change it or, or try something different. System 5 init is another of the sacred cows I don't hold holy. You know, what's so great about a collection of shell scripts that does fuzzy and confusing things and quite often lies to you? Okay, we adapted to that. We developed ways. So I stop the web server and then I run PSAX for it ah, and kill those bits that it left behind. Um, but as humans, we, we condition ourselves to our current environment, and we're not always good at stepping back and saying, well, okay, that was, that was then, and it was good then, but this is something new that I'd like to, to embrace that brings me some really positive benefits. Maybe to relearn things or just pretend it didn't happen. Streams, I mean, hell, we didn't even adopt that one. Uh, again, see the archives for Linus's opinion on this. It's pretty funny, much like his opinion on the standards. Just set it on fire and burn it. And I don't think that Linux has suffered the lack of it. Uh, periodically, we get the question at Red Hat, oh, will you support streams for our environment? And we say no, and there's some unhappiness and hanging of hands, and then move on and the systems keep working and not many people die. So, one of the things that I think is, is really fundamental and important here, choose your battles carefully. Life is just too short to jump into every discussion and flame and rail and 
You know, if you don't care enough to get involved in it, well, maybe just take up gardening or, or find something that uh, is, is a bit less contentious for you to do. Um, me, I said I was working on early 2000s, uh, and DVD playback was really important for me. I, I spent hours reading the standards. Uh, I had kind of the IFO file structure burned into my memory, and I wanted to be able to use those things on Linux. Um, in those days, Zine was really the only, or Zena, however you wish to pronounce it, was the only media player that, that kind of did that properly. So again, a bit like my GNOME themes, I hand compiled it to begin with, and I carried my build trees around. Later, I got a bit better at packaging it. Not as good as the guys that eventually did it in, in Aura. Um, but that allowed me to keep the thing that I really cared about working as other things changed and, and around me. It took some work, but the work paid off dividends in giving me peace and quiet when I just wanted to watch Team America or whatever movie was cool at the time. Um, so decide what it is that you're interested in and choose what you use to make it easy. Um, when it comes to things that maybe are not so directly related to what you're doing, don't sweat the changes, you know? If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. Move on. Life really is much too short. So the other choice to make once you've decided what you care about is what weapons are you going to bring to the party? What are you going to use to solve your problems? Unfortunate wording, maybe. Uh, I was thinking of the Fat Boy Slim track when I wrote this, not... Um, the other thing to emphasize here is that the things you choose for one interest may not be the same as the things you choose for another. I know it's nice to have everything uniform and, and conforming everywhere, kind of get a kick out of symmetry and elegance, but in a practical and changing world, it isn't always the best decision. So I probably run about five or six different distributions at the moment, different versions of RHEL, Fedora, different spins of Fedora. Um, I've also had an interest in uh, music production and media playing in the past. Um, years ago with Windows, Weinberg and that kind of thing. But now we have some, some pretty good tooling on Linux. Um, it's actually a lot better in Fedora these days, but a few years ago when I was starting out with that, I ran Ubuntu Studio. They had later versions of the applications. They were nicely integrated. I didn't have to worry about what's my Jack D doing and where does this go, and it was just there for me, and I could focus on the music and the, the production process, which, you know, when I'm doing music, I don't want to be program, well, program the program the computer so much. Um, I used, at one point, uh, Gentoo or Gentoo. Um, the reason for that, I wanted to track new features coming into GNOME. At the time on Fedora, I tried to build it from source, and I ran away screaming with my hair on fire. <laughs> Gentoo with Portage and Emerge, OK. It's not uh, a system without some problems, especially 10 years ago. Um, but it made it very easy for me to run those bleeding edge uh, releases or snapshot and be kind of going well oh can you oh no uh, emerge work. and then you just went away for two days while it rebuilt your kernel and you live see an open office and firefox and everything um, but if you make your choices and review them as they become less suitable uh, use fedora electronics lab when i'm doing my tesla coils and my electrical stuff. Um, a, I use the music tools in, in Fedora natively, because maybe Ubuntu still has an edge, I don't know, I didn't look, because they're good enough now. And it brings me back to some more uniformity in my environment. Um, similar choices for how you host things, you know, does the cloud work for you? Does a local system work for you, or your own private server? Uh, a lot of my friends used to have Polos, most of them don't anymore, unless they're, they're running really big environments. Uh, out on the internet. The point is to, for each problem you need to solve or each thing you want to do, find the path of least resistance. If 
you're not taking the easiest route to where you want to be. You're making life harder for yourself, you know? It's the old saying, um, the beatings will continue until morale improves, only you're beating yourself if you're not making it simple. And just because one solution to one problem works for me, it doesn't mean it will work for you. Consider your own needs and your own preferences. We're all, thankfully, different. Um, be a horrific world if it was filled with clones of me. I'm very untidy. Finally, when you can't avoid the change, you have to deal with it. Um, I'm very much known as the candle wax and sticky tape guy. It's, it's actually the title of my blog. Um, you know, uh, I also drive 4x4s in my spare time, a Land Rover. And there's this saying, a Land Rover driver need keep only two things, WD-40, lubricating spray, and gaffer tape. If it moves and it shouldn't, use the If it doesn't move and it should, use the spray. <laughs> so if you can't live with something, you've really got three choices. You can fix it, you can jump in, get involved, and help to, to influence. You can say, fussig it, or whatever you want to interpret that word as, or you can just forget about it and go and do something else with your life. Um, when you're doing this, especially when you're working around it, like my old uh, self-packaged things, um, automate the dull bit, otherwise you're going to have to do them again. And that's going to become really tedious. Um, <laughs> Focus on the things that you want to do, the enjoyable parts, and select things to make that easy. You could also get involved in maintaining. I think there's this perception that you, know, you need to be some hardcore developer to maintain packages. Not true. I, I know a lot of system administrators who don't rate their development skills, but they do a brilliant job of, of packaging software, whether it's for the distribution or for their own use. Um, and if you start doing something for your own use, chances are it may be You can script things, you can wrap things, you can define aliases, adapters. I have a, a bash aliases file this big. Um, when I first started working in Red Hat Support Engineering Group, I wrote scripts that would interface to the ticketing system, that would set things up and download things for me. I still have them today. Same names, my fingers do the same thing, I don't think about it. I had to rewrite them three times as the internal systems changed, but my interface never changed. I had a little bit to do to automate the boring bits, but then I can just get on with the fun of solving problems for customers. <laughs> Today, it's never been easier to keep multiple systems and multiple distributions around. Virtualization, KVM, containers, VirtualBox, if you like that. Personally, I find that's one of those pain in the butt things to keep working, but I know a lot of people differ in that, and they like it. You can also use mock. Uh, I've had a, a single Fedora machine that could compile RHEL 3, RHEL 4, RHEL 5, just by chirruting into a different environment. I kind of got the trick from setting up VMs in the old days with yum install roots and so on. And I'd just like to finish up with a quote from Apple in 1997. I do wonder how they feel about this one now with Android and some of the other going on. Um, but here is crazy ones, the rebels, the troublemakers. Let's get the next bit because those people that want to change things, and I'm not looking at anyone in the audience when I say this, um, if they think they can change the world, very often they are the ones that will do it. Uh, we can either resist or follow along and take the benefits. So thank you for listening. Um, we have a few minutes left for questions, and uh, if you're interested, sources and further reading, there's a whole bunch of historical links I've dug up there. So anybody have any... Uh, Questions, comments, booze? Yes, uh, I don't, don't even try and write the URLs down. There's actually a second page of them even, so <laughs> <laughs> I will copy it to the USB and they'll be online and available. No more questions? What about the guy that I paid 100 crowns to to ask a good question? Where did my money go? <laughs> uh, no bribes. <laughs> In that case, thank you for listening, and uh, I'll clear the floor for the next speaker.